Hey everyone, my name is Martha Woodward and I own a maid service in, um, well, outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma. I live in Kansas though, and I have been very much an absentee owner for years, but even more so probably the last year, I go to, well, I don't even hardly go to the office other than to drop off supplies now and then. Um, when we run out of in inventory because my management staff is totally remote as well. And so I see my staff once a month and it's for fun activities, usually outside of the office or staff meeting. So that's who I am, what I do. As some of you know me, I own quality driven software, which will come into play in this talk a little bit, but everything that I talk about, you do not need quality driven for. Um, I will warn you that I, the slides are not like these slides that have tons of information. They're just to guide me along in the topic. So really you're just gonna be taking notes. And then the last part of business is that I'm going to turn off the camera and just talk to you because I think it's distracting and uh, it's distracting for me. It's distracting for you. I'm used to talking to an audience, but for now, I'll just talk to a screen. So anyway, I'm going to go away, but keep talking. All right. So here we go. So creating a self-running quality program where people just do what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it. That's what I'm here to help you with today. First off, let me ask you, again, usually I'm looking at an audience, but how many of you love your business and your employees right now? Does anyone feel like they're held hostage by their employees in their own business? I don't know about you, but that's not what I imagined when I left my corporate job to open my own maid service. I thought I'd be the one steering the ship with the help of my supportive employees, but boy, was I wrong. At least for those early years, I was wrong. The good news is you can have all that and it's actually pretty simple, straightforward process, but you have to do the work. And how do I know it? I know it because I was you. My first few years in the service business were living hell. They really were. I cried more times than I've ever cried in my lifetime and I've gone through cancer treatment. And I can tell you that the anguish that I felt going through chemo didn't hold a candle to the anguish that I felt in those early years of my business. And the reason why is going through chemo, I felt like, okay, this is a solution. This is what I need to do to get to this outcome. Whereas, when my business kind of felt in the pit of despair, I didn't know a way out. I just didn't see a light at the end of the tunnel. I recently read a study in Inc. Magazine that said only 43% of entrepreneurs felt happy at work. And that's actually about 15% more than employees working at a corporate job. But I still think 43% is pretty crappy if you ask me. I mean, we are pursuing the American dream being entrepreneurs and steering the ship in our own business, right? Well, supposedly so. So what about you? Are you happy in your business? Do you feel like you have control over the business? Do you 
feel like you're drowning in the sea of horrible employees? Forgive me. It, yeah, I want to say my slides weren't working. Um, or do you feel like things are just utter chaos? And that's certainly how I felt. But don't worry, I'm going to take you through the process that I use to climb out of that pit of despair to a culture that really doesn't require management staff there at all in the day-to-day -day world. Now, you don't have to do that. You can certainly be in your own business and be there every day. But just getting things to run more smoothly will make you enjoy your business so much more. So let's talk about what it was like back in the day. Attendance, I had attendance. <laughs> I had attendance problems for sure. I had an attendance policy, but let's get real, I didn't follow it. My attendance policy was basically that I knew who was gonna be at work when they showed up that day. Like when I saw the whites of their eyes, all right, that was kind of roll call for me. And um, that was a terrible way to live. Quality, again, it was kind of a hope and pray policy. Um, I would send them out to the jobs, prayed that none of the clients called to complain, and called that a good day. An attitude, that was really the only core value that I didn't suck at. I didn't allow blatant disrespect, but I allowed way, way too much. And my, de my employees definitely ruled the roost. I knew things were out of control and I honestly hated going to the office. I wasn't very fond of my employees at the time. And I knew if a current client was calling, it probably was not to brag about the great job we were doing. Does any of that sound familiar? And if it does, who do you think is control is in control at your company? It's the employees, right? But do your employees own your business? Do they worry about paying the bills? Do they work pretty much 24 seven trying to make that business succeed? No, they don't. So why would you give them control over your business, at least intermittently? It's fear. Fear that if you tighten the policies, which really doesn't mean tighten the policies, it just means enforce your policies. It's fear that your employees might leave you. It's fear that you'll be short-handed and Lord help us, you might have to go fill in. It's fear that you'll have to slow down growth because you don't have enough staff. But let me ask you, what's more terrifying? Is it more terrifying to think that you'll need to slow down growth a bit while you fix your employee issues and figure out how to stack the applicant deck to get more people in, but then it changes things going forward? Or is it more terrifying to think that your business will grow, but it's gonna feel just like this, out of control? Now, I don't know about you, but when I asked myself that question long, long ago, hands down, I did not want to continue owning a business that felt as bad as it felt at the time. Lastly, think about this. When you head to work in the morning, can you feel reasonably sure that everyone's going to show up 
to work? Or do you not know, like me, until you see them? And when you send people out to their jobs, can you trust that everything should go well? Or are you fearful that the complaints will start rolling in? And if you cannot answer yes, yes, everybody should show up, and yes, everything should go well, then why would you want to hang on to that arrangement anyway? Isn't it better to risk being shorthanded in lieu of a bigger payout and know what you can count on? I think it is. I'd rather act proactively and prepare any day than always reactively recovering. Because being proactive, even if it's bad, you're in control. Whereas reactive, you're at the mercy of others. So the turning point for me in this whole chaos thing was the busiest week of the year, the week before Thanksgiving. I had a bully employee that called me to let me know when she would and wouldn't be at work in the next week. Now, mind you, she was full time. And it's not like she had asked off for time off. She was just letting me know her schedule. And I remember thinking then and there, what the heck? I mean, it really was my wake up call to who's in charge here. And that I had totally lost control. It was the last straw for me. And, you know, it was a godsend because that's when I got myself together and started turning things around. So first I identified the problems and I had to figure out what was broken or most broken. So I had to look at my policies and procedures and was I actually following them? And I had to look at my training issues, you know, was I, did I have a plan with training? Was I consistent? Were there reproducible results? No, there weren't, definitely, but those were things I had to fix. Um, you know, I had to identify that I had people there who were poor cultural fits and I was allowing them to stay. And lastly, we had a culture of mediocrity. You know, it was just average was okay in my company back then. And I really didn't work on um, thriving. We worked on surviving. So, I first dusted off my policies and procedures and I started rewriting my policies based on what would my policies have to look like where my best employees could stay so that I could consistently follow my policies and keep my best people. So how many absences is that? How many quality complaints is that? You know, how much breakage is that? That's the angle I was going by when I rewrote the policies. And then the first thing I had to do was, after I rewrote those policies, is I had to stick by them through thick and thin. So shorthanded or not, I had to enforce the policies. But by doing that, I probably gained the most traction of all, including paper performance in my business. Because I now was gaining trust. When you do 
what you say you're going to do, you start gaining trust and respect from especially the people you want to keep. Because think about it. Is your culture running people off? Do you get good people and then you're surprised when they don't stay? Anytime we lose somebody, we analyze why. Was it most of the time now what it is, is um, it was a bad hire. And so we didn't do an adequate job of screening them in that uh, interview process and not hire them in the first place. But here's the thing. These days, as compared to the old days, the old days, I used to think that I could change them and maybe influence them and get a better result. And that is crazy talk. Um, if you have employees who kind of show you who they are, especially in those early days of training, and that what they show you does not fit your culture, you need to get rid of them fast because they're on their very best behavior and you're only asking for trouble if you let them stay. There's a quote from Tony Robbins and I don't remember it exactly, but the gist of it is basically that it's not, you know, that new hire that's going to destroy your company. It's the, it's the bad hire that you allow to stay. And that is so true. You can do your company irreparable harm by keeping people who you should not keep. I, I just truly believe that's probably the biggest error that you can make. And here's the thing, when you do start to believe that and you do start to let people go like you should, that you know you should, then you gain so much trust and respect from your employees. And the other thing that happens is um, people start to believe you. So they're going to either toe the line and do what they're supposed to do, or they'll probably end up quitting before you fire them because now they're like, Ooh, she's, she really means it. She's going to fire me. And so they'll make up some excuse and they'll leave you, but it's because they know that the writing's on the wall that you're going to fire them. So, you have to be consistent in everything you do. So not only following your policies and procedures, but I touched on your training. Your training is the fundamentals of, it's like the reading and writing that we learn in elementary school. Training is the fundamentals that you give your employees so they'll be successful. Even if you do not do a paper performance system like I do, you still have a system that is more informal. So your paper performance is complaints or compliments. You know, that's still a performance system. And if you don't give them the training that they deserve consistently. It has to have a process to it. You know, it cannot be fly by night. If you don't give them that, then you shouldn't be expecting really anything out of them besides whatever your policies are. But they're at a disadvantage because you did not set up the foundation that basically you promised them when you hired them. 
So that's where you start. You identify your issues, what's causing your company the most grief. Is it attendance? Is it policy? Is it attitude issues? Or is it kind of all of the above? You decide what you can tolerate, and that's your policy. And I personally like to go a little more conservative um, and then give them the ability to earn more. So to give you an example, you know, we have a policy that for attendance that they can have three unplanned absences in a six month period. However, I do allow them to earn more. And I have a process for that where they can earn more unplanned days. And I personally love that because should I let that bad hire through that is going to call off, call off, call off, but yet they've not broken our attendance policy so that I can fire them, then I'm stuck with them until I can weed them out the proper way. But if I am a little more conservative and I don't allow as many days, then I can weed that bad fit out sooner. But for those people that, you know, and it happens, I've had people who have great, great quality scores, the clients love them, but maybe they're a single mom with four or five kids, they're going to be gone more and they need more days so that they are able to earn more through their client satisfaction scores. So that's just an example of how I, my policies are fairly tight and conservative, but I allow them to earn more leeway. So I really haven't talked about any like new concepts that you don't already know. You know to follow your procedures. You know you need a good solid training program. Um, but yet most of you, well, I shouldn't say that because I don't know who's watching and who's not, but many people that I talk to, they know it, but they don't do it. I mean, do I know what I need to do to lose weight? I know about calories. I know about carbs. I know about exercise. But yet, do I do that on a consistent basis? No. So that's why I don't lose weight like I'd like to. But whose fault is it? It's my fault. And so if you're having employee problems, ask yourself, do you know these things? Are you doing these things? And if not, whose fault is it? And have you been pushed far enough to actually put things into action? like I was. So we've talked a lot about, um, you know, the disciplinary side of it and what you have to do to fix the problems. Now, this is kind of the flip side. Once you get your, you know, like the bare essentials of your culture fixed, your policy and procedures, your training, things are transparent and consistent, then you can start to work on paper performance. And, you know, how do you get more of the behavior that you want and need? How do you improve your attendance and improve your quality, not just expect the bare minimum? So much of the desired behavior in my company is driven around client satisfaction. And I choose to be very proactive and ask people what they thought of their service after every single cleaning. And I know many people don't buy into this concept. I've been doing this for 
seven, eight years, and I followed the lead of some smart people who were doing it. I wasn't the first, but I followed their lead and I kind of ran with it. And um, for me, I wrap my head around the fact that I might as well ask the clients what they thought, even in the days where our quality was in the toilet. I still wrapped my head around the fact that I needed to go ahead and ask them because whatever they were thinking, it wasn't like it was going to pop in their head because I asked. They're already thinking it and probably complaining about us to our friends, to their friends, and I needed to know. So I started asking. And I've always used a survey where it takes 30 seconds. It's just a, basically a how did we do? Click that emoticon smiley face thing that corresponds to how we did. You know, it has wording and stuff in there too. But that right there, that's all it takes. And we get our clients to buy into the fact that they get so much back from this and they do. I mean, when I started seven, eight years ago surveying, like I say, our quality was in the toilet and we have come up a full point out of four on the scale of four. Now, most people are on a scale of five that use quality driven, but I'm still on the old scale, but I'm saying that is 25%. I mean, that's huge. And, um, but that's where we came from. Um, you know, I'd be embarrassed to say that, but we're, we're way past that now. And our quality just hasn't um, really moved much up or down in years because we're up where I'm totally comfortable with. What used to be our bonuses, everybody stays above. So I'm very happy with it. But if we didn't consistently ask and measure and be transparent about, it wouldn't be there. And I have no doubt that it wouldn't. So we use quality scores as a huge part of how we run the business and it allows me to be an absentee owner because I can wash those scores easily. Um, but it's not just about me watching the scores. It's really about the employees watching their scores and me getting them to buy in and want a better score. So I've, always been um i've always been huge on paper performance well i shouldn't say always but you know seven eight years been big on it and that probably came from a passion for sports back in the day uh you know i had two favorite sports one was running cross country and the other was gymnastics and in cross country, obviously there's a time, but you also measure yourself against the pack. And when you're finished running, you get your time, but you also got this medal and you knew, like they announced your name and you'd get a medal and you would um, know how you scored in the pack. You know, were you third? Were you seventh, you know, and, and how did your score compare? And then um, gymnastics, I mean, talk about scores. It's down to like the tenth of a decimal, or I'm sorry, the hundredth of a decimal, actually. And, you know, any little bent knee, non-pointed foot were deductions. And I think from that background, data and scoring has been huge to me 
but I see other people be really successful with it too. And maybe they don't place as much importance on the score as I do, but sports do teach you to keep score. And actually life teaches you to keep score. I mean, we grew up in school getting graded. And in my case, if you're lucky, you knew how you did compared to the top score and the average score and the low score. Life keeps score and your employees crave the data. So in my company, the way that I apply that is we absolutely have a minimum tolerated type of policy. Though we have the policies and procedures that say you need bare minimum of this score and you can't have more than this many complaints. And that's what will keep you out of trouble. But we also have measures in that we want people to know like how they can get um, promotions and bonuses and things like that. So scores do drive performance and it's really the data that drives the performance. And what I mean by that is Sure, they can have a score, but if they can't see the data, like how, you know, how those individual comments and scores add up to their average. And I also believe in showing them not only their score, but everybody else's score. And that drives people to want a higher score. Now, a lot of people will use a similar system, but they don't show anything but that employee's score. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's whatever works in your company culture. But I can tell you that we have a very positive company culture and we show each other scores. But it's how we handle it. And you can't slap an incentive program on a toxic culture because then it is very carrot and stick instead of coaching and reward type system. Um, you know, really it's more coaching and recognition than even the reward because when you have a pay per performance system, sure, you may have a monetary bonus or um, some kind of um, contest or raffle. I mean, there's all kinds of pay per performance systems that you can run. But when it comes down to it, it is more about the affirmation and the building of self esteem and self confidence than it is about the monetary thing. Now, your reward system, you absolutely have to figure out what matters to them. Um, if you were, to, for instance, I'll give you an example. I just recently said we were gonna do a contest and I said, um, I gave them some choices of what they'd want and <laughs> I was very wrong about what they would want. And so, you know, if I would have just started this contest, and that's not really a paper performance system. I mean, it is and it isn't, but um, I will run some intermittent type paper performance systems such as contest, but then we have year round things that we do as well. But if I would have run that contest and it had picked a reward that nobody cared about, then nobody cares about it. And they wouldn't do what I'm hoping they would do. So when I have something that I want, then I figure out what they need and I build a system around that. 
So you just have to lay out the groundwork and you will find that when you have a newer employee and you have this kind of system where your policies are all very consistent and transparent and you have a pay perform performance system, then your newer employees hit a fork in the road and you will see people rise to the occasion and you will see their scores start to climb and I literally watch this and people that I work with do the same thing. You can, you get to where you know who's going to make it early on and who's not. If you don't see those scores starting to go up, that person will exit out of your system because they will not like not getting the rewards and they will blame it on your system. And I just let them blame it on the system because I know We've been running this system seven, eight years, and it's very successful. So, you know, that's the victim mentality. But I like that it weeds out the people that aren't a good fit for our culture, because if they slide through training, which most of ours, if we pick, um, if we get a bad hire, then usually within the first few days we will exit that person out of the system but sometimes they get through training and like i say i can watch those scores and i will know who's going to make it and who's not um and again just make sure that those incentives are things they really really want all right I'm just giving you an example of the data, you know, I mean, it's just fake data. So, and again, this is, this is quality driven, but before quality driven, we surveyed, you could use survey monkey, which is free and you could do something very similar, but then you're going to put it in an Excel spreadsheet and you're going to do the figuring yourself. And you have to make sure that you keep it very transparent to your staff. Um, the whole reason Quality Driven was created was because it is a little bit time consuming, but very doable. So don't, you know, throw your hands up and be like, well, I don't want to do, you know, I don't want that system and it's too much trouble. Well, I'm not going to lie. It is some trouble. But in my opinion, it's very much worth it. I mean, I had a terrible, terrible culture before I started some of these things. So it's absolutely worth the hours that it takes a week to not have to feel terrible about my business 24-7. Um, but there are easier ways if you choose to do it that way. All right. Um, you know, and what's funny is my son, who I've recently hired to help at Quality Driven a little bit, reminded me when I was talking about his pay structure and it's tiered and it's very goal-based and he started smiling and I asked him what he was smiling about. And he said, you've, already, you've always paid like this. And he reminded me that very, very early on in my company that, um, you know, when marketing dollars were really tight and we were doing door hangers. And I remember distinctly, I had ordered well, I didn't until he reminded me, but I had ordered 1,200 door hangers and they had something time sensitive on there. And my kids were like nine and 10 years old and I would get my kids and some of their friends and I had a van and there was no way I could get all of those out and run the business. And I think I was cleaning some at the time. So 
what I do is I get the van load of kids. And my goal was we were going to deliver all 1,200 of those. Well, it was super hot. And anyway, around 800, 900 of them, they were dragging butt. They were hot and I did feel bad for them. I really did. But I also really needed these done and I knew we were so close. So I remember I told them, I will pay you X number of dollars if you stop right now. But if you finish and they were three quarters of the way done, I said, if you finish them all, I will pay you double and I will take you with your money to shop, which, you know, kids nine, 10, they want to spend that money as soon as they get it. So that was enticing. And we'll go to the pool. So <laughs> they finished, they finished. And if I wouldn't have figured out what they wanted and what I could entice them with, so that it was a win-win for both of us. I got all those brochures out. I wasn't gonna waste any money because the, you know, the offer date expired. And they didn't hate me because, you know, at the end of it, it was like, I got double the money. I got to go to Walmart or Target or wherever we went to spend their money and they got a pool party. So he's right. I have always believed in this system to, it's like you can get people to buy in to what you need because they're getting what they want. And I do preach building an environment where your employees can depend on what you say you'll do, whether that means reward or terminate, because it results in an environment of trust and respect. And when you have a culture of transparency, consistency, respect, you create a culture of gratitude and not despair. And just think how that culture translates to not only your home life and that you feel so much better about your business, but also your employee's home life. Because you've created a culture that builds an employee up, they'll leave work truly feeling like they matter and their work matters. So just imagine that employee will now go home to their kids and maybe they'll have a little bit more patience helping them with their homework assignment or make the time to listen to their kids talk about their day. And that has such a ripple effect. So you're not just influencing how you feel and in your family, but you're influencing other families. And I, I know it's kind of a Pollyanna way to look at it, um, but I know that your company culture not only affects you, but it has an effect on your employees and a ripple effect on both of your families. So I urge you to start building that culture where things are more transparent, that you let people know how to stay out of trouble and they don't have to guess if they're getting a bonus. You build a culture that's consistent so you do what you say you're going to do even when it's hard and you give them the data that they're craving and when you do all of that 
then you have to make sure that you not only celebrate with, you know, maybe goal celebrations, um, parties, whatever, but the heart and soul of it is really that affirmation and the pats on the back and letting the employees know you did it. I am proud of you and, you know, feel so good about yourself. And we don't say it in those words, but it's the constant affirmation that we give them. And so we don't harp on the bad things. We really drive our culture around the affirmations. And we have a whole system of how we make sure that's in their face, you know, um, that if they're not earning those rewards and affirmations, then they see others getting that, so they want it. And if you reinforce the behavior that you want and need, with those attaboys and the celebrations, then you're gonna get more of that. I can promise you. And just remember, it is simple, but it is not easy at all. It's going to be so hard and you're gonna to wanna to quit. You really will. It's, you know, again, it's like a diet. You know, it's not, it's not something that you can turn on and off. And when I say a diet, uh, it's a, your culture turnaround is just like your turnaround and your eating habits. You can, you know, it's a similar kind of process. It is a day in, day out, you know, toe the line, stick with it kind of um, situation. But you have to plow through it in the tough times as well as the easy times. And if you can do it, I promise you that you and your staff will be so glad you did. So anyway, good luck to you. Um, you can reach me through the Quality Driven Facebook group or... Um, Martha at qualitydrivensoftware.com. I will warn you, I do get a lot of emails, so be patient. And if I don't answer you right away, you might have to ask a couple of times and it's nothing personal, but um, I run three businesses, so it's really busy. So just bear with me. But uh, anyway, I hope that I've hit home. If you need some of that help, and I do wish you the very best. Thanks for listening.